Today we are continuing in Known Only to God, Known Only to God, and we are going to be in a familiar text this morning. It's Luke chapter 2. If you'll just turn there and have that in readiness, Luke chapter 2. And today we're talking about the fact that it's the message, not the messenger. It's the message, not the messenger. Let's go before God in prayer, and then we'll get right into our sermon. Father God, we are so thankful for all that you give us and for all that you do for us. We're thankful for the beauty of music and what it, what it conveys to our heart and our mind as it's being sung. We're thankful for every form of worship, whether it is just simply fellowshipping with one another, singing songs of praise, meeting at the table. We're thankful for every opportunity and every way to worship you. We're also thankful, Father, for the opportunity to share the message of Jesus Christ because it is the only hope in this world. So we pray today that as we talk about this message, Father, that as we examine this passage that we often kind of put into a, a cubby hole and kind of keep it, that we can see that your power does tremendous things and also be challenged to do the same. Bless us, be with us, and guide us. But may your words be heard today, Father, not mine. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, when I was a kid, I used to actually like watching old westerns. Really, when I was a kid, there wasn't much more other than old westerns, but I used to enjoy watching them. And really, if you think about it, any movie that was, any show, any movie that was made 40 or 50 years ago, I find one thing different about them that does not exist in the ones that we find today. Do you remember the days when you could actually go out and watch a movie and the hero of the movie was really just your average Joe? It was your average person who, by the way, had the courage to do something that was right. And because of that, lives were saved. But it was the average person. It was simpler then. The good guy, by the way, could always and would always wind up on top. It, it took a strong moral compass. It took some perseverance. But they won the day. And when I found myself seeing a movie like that, by the way, and, and that's the reason why I even feel that same way today. When I found myself leaving those movies, I would find myself in the same situation, and that is simply this. I'm capable of doing what that hero did. See, I can actually do what they did. When you left the movie, you were inspired. And why? Because you knew that it was possible that if you had the courage, that if you had the morals, that if you had the strength of character, you could also be a hero. And the fact was, those were good times. Those were really good times when you felt that if you were called to do the right thing, like what you saw in the movie, you thought to yourself, maybe I would do the exact same thing. At least I pray that I would. By the way, that's why I love watching historical accounts or movies of true history, things that happened real because we often see the average person who did a heroic thing by what they did in their life. Now, the movies that we find today, the movies that we find today, you and I could never, ever be a hero in any way, shape, or form. They do things that are absolutely impossible. Now, it's not that the movie's not entertaining. Don't get me wrong. If they weren't entertaining, they wouldn't make movies like that. Nobody would go to watch them. But millions of dollars are spent. But if we're being honest with ourselves, we all would have to admit that we don't really know anybody that can speak 15 languages fluently, who's former special force, an expert government assassin, who can defuse a bomb with two sticks of gum, a penny, and a dime, and oh, by the way, they also know how to perform surgery on themselves if they get hurt and it doesn't bother them at all. If we're being honest, that's not real. But the, the fact is, when you walk away from a movie like that, what you actually feel it's kind of useless because you know you could never do that. When you watch a movie like that, you know there's always a point in that movie that you look at it and you say to yourself, yeah, I'd be dead right there. It'd be over. All over for me. Yeah, I, I would have died right there. And the reason why is because I haven't read the book yet, how to short circuit a train's engine, jump a track hanging with one arm at 100 miles an hour. But don't panic. I've ordered the book. And when I get done reading it, I'll let you read it as well. But movies like that make you leave thinking, I could never, ever be a hero because I just don't have what it takes, which I believe leads to a chronic problem that we find not only in the world, but we also find even in the church. And that is the feeling of inadequacy. See, inadequacy is a covert little ninja that will sneak up on you and will tease you and will taunt you and will belittle you like never before, no matter where you happen to be. Whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's at the grocery store, and sometimes even at church. 
Now, I went to an event one time where a bunch of ministers were at, and there was a gentleman speaking, and this is what he said. He said, before I ever start a sermon series, I will read five books on the subject. And every November, I will write out my whole year's sermons. In other words, I'll put all together the sermon series I'm going to do for the entire year. And I sat there among that group of ministers, and I thought to myself, am I the only guy that thinks this guy's flat out lying? But maybe I was. I love to read, but if I read five books on every subject that I was going to preach on, I'd preach about five sermons a year. Now, I love to read, but I can't do that much. But then... Then there's that feeling of inadequacy that sneaks up. And for a split second, I think to myself, but what if he does do that? What if he does do that? Then what am I doing wrong? Why can't I do what he's talking about now? But then it finally hits me. The reason why is because I haven't read that book about how to short-circuit a train while hanging with one arm at 100 miles an hour. That's why I can't do a year's worth of sermons at one time. Let's face it, the fact is, the things that people sometimes say to try to uh, uh, encourage us usually wind up doing the exact opposite. Instead of empowering and making us feel capable of doing, we actually walk away with feelings of an inadequacy. I could never go on a mission trip and do the work like they just said they did. I could never take an hour and actually read and just simply pray each day. I could never be as strong as they are in that situation. I'm sure that every single person in this room at some point in their life has had that problem, even if they're the most confident person in the world, at some point you get this idea that you could never accomplish what really needs to be done in your life, that you're not even capable of doing it. And and, and there is that place that happens more than we could ever imagine. The greatest place this takes place when it's lack of confidence and my inability to do things is at the sharing of my faith. That's where most people feel like, I can't do that. I'm inadequate. Actually, I'm incompetent at doing it. Most people feel completely inadequate when it comes to clearly communicating what they believe and why they actually believe it. Most just simply say this, well, look, that's why we hire a minister. That's his job. He's gone to college for that. No one really need, can, can share a faith the way he does, so let him do it. He's got the special training. Or some people will ever say this. They say, well, I'm not really sure how to share my faith, and I don't want to come off as being pushy and offend anybody by what I believe. Now, now maybe the reason that we feel that way is because we've seen people try to share their faith before, and they know just enough about the Bible to do damage. They act silly, and they make the Bible even sound contradictive. Maybe that's the reason why you feel that way. Or maybe you've had one of those members of cults come to your door and knock on the door and tell you, oh, I believe in Jesus just like you do, but let us come into your house and do a Bible study with you. And so what you wind up saying is, look, I don't ever want anybody to think I'm a Bible thumper, and I certainly don't want them to think I'm a a member of one of these cults, so I'll just keep my mouth shut. And I won't say a word. Maybe you feel like I mentioned last week in the sermon that you've done so many terrible things that your life has been so messed up that God would never want to use you in any way, shape, or form in his kingdom. John Wooden, who was the first person, by the way, to ever be in the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame as both a player and a coach, actually had good advice when it comes to this. This is what he says. Don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Now, let me say that again. Don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Listen, the fact is, what we need to remember is this. People in this world are still looking for truth, a truth that is real, a truth that is relevant, and a truth that is theological. People are looking for that. And and I really believe this. People are getting tired of what the world has to offer. The fact is they can't be trusted. The world cannot be trusted. Society is sliding into a tremendous moral depression. But we also have to remember that you can recover from depression. That it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of dedication, but you can recover. See, people want to hear someone talk with confidence about the Bible. They want to hear somebody talk with confidence about Jesus Christ, about hope, about peace, about love, about grace, about mercy, about forgiveness, because these things never go out of style. Regardless of what the world wants you and I to believe, that Christianity is old-fashioned. Stop pushing that old idea. It never goes out of style. Everybody wants to know about hope and forgiveness and grace and love and mercy. They never go out of style. 
ever. So I would offer this, that when it comes to being a hero for Christ, the older movies are much more true than the newer movies. The fact is it doesn't take special skill. You don't need to be able to make a bomb out of last night's meatloaf in order to be able to do it. The world is not looking for a larger than life hero. A life-size one will do just fine. And that's what you and I are called to do. The world just needs more people that are willing to be heroes and there is no situation in your life that is more the case of that than sharing your faith with Jesus or for Jesus Christ to other people. So when it comes to sharing for Christ with others, what we need to do, we need to remember that we don't need to be trained, we don't need to be polished in order to communicate correctly. All you need to do is genuinely love Jesus Christ. So the question that you have to wrestle with is do you genuinely love Jesus Christ? Because if you do, then you're going to do what you need to do to share the message. Your wording doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be from the heart. All you have to do to share Jesus Christ is tell people what he's done in your life. Nobody can tell your story better than you. That is who God uses. People who connect with someone else and share the faith. That's who God uses. But this concept is not new to God, by the way. He's been sharing his story through untrained people for thousands of years. And I want you to know that there is a freedom for you that you need to grab onto. And I pray that by the end of this sermon that maybe you'll feel it. You don't have to feel inadequate. You can relax because the power of the freedom of Jesus Christ is located in his message, not the messengers. You can be set free from that. See, God demonstrated this over 2,000 years ago when he picked some men who were completely unpolished, more ordinary, more untrained than anybody else in the area, but they shared the greatest news that they could ever be told. And that's what we're going to start at this morning. That's our first point. Our first point is simply this, the least likely messengers. For some of you, this morning's text is going to blow you away, and the reason why is because we don't usually read this text unless it's Christmas time or at least in the month of December. But I want us to see a truth that's here that applies to every single one of us. Remember, the Bible is not just for Christmas and Easter. It's for other things as well. So listen to me if you'll, or listen and follow along. Luke chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own hometown to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what, his, or what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, which was just as they had been told. Now, I want, to, want you to go ahead and notice that what we have here is a group of shepherds out in the field watching their sheep by night. We see that in the biblical account. Now, believe it or not, shepherds really had a very important job in society. Now, they weren't really treated with a lot of respect, but they had a very important job in society. Their sheep provided wool for clothing, also milk, and the wool for other cloth materials, as well as meat for people as well. So the work of a shepherd was extremely hard and it was extremely important, so it was not taken lightly. However, 
The shepherds were not like the rest of the people in society. They spent many hours in silence. They lived outside of the general population. They were really their own person because they were their own boss. And other than shearing and selling the wool, they really didn't get a lot of communication with other people other than other uh, shepherds, of course. But here's the time of Caesar Augustus, and he calls for an entire uh, a census of the entire Roman world to count every person, but most importantly, to count the Jews. That was the necessity of this, to count the Jews and make sure. And they had to go to their town of their home birth. Now, the shepherds probably didn't care much about this census. They cared about their flocks. They knew how many sheep they had. They knew how many were about to give birth. And they knew the name that they would give the lamb when it was born. They protected their flock as well, their rod and their staff they had in their hand. And anything that would try to take the life of any of their flock would be put to death by both of those. But one thing for sure they did not know about, they didn't know much about the Lamb of God and that he had already rode in the town, nestled in the womb of his own mother. So they sat in the field at night, not aware of anything at all about Joseph and all the scurrying he was trying to find a a safe place for his wife in order to be be able to give birth. They had no idea they were rushing around to bring this baby into the world. No matter where they were, their focus wasn't on that, but I want you to think about that just for a moment. The God who created this universe and everything in it was now entering the world in a very humble and a very quiet manner. And after the birth, Mary wraps Jesus up in strips of cloth because that's all they had in order to keep him warm. She places him inside of a feeding trough that's filled with hay in order to probably provide insulation and warmth. But out there in the fields are the shepherds that God created sitting under the stars that God created. Imagine the creator of all things just a quarter mile away from where they sat. The only way these guys were going to know anything at all spectacular about the Lord of all creation, the Christ, the Messiah, had stepped into the world was if there was a spectacular announcement. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, Luke chapter 2, verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I want you to think about that for a moment. One moment, there's your, your average night out in the middle of the field, maybe sitting with other shepherds and hearing the sheep and all that, and looking at the stars of the sky, everything's dark and quiet, and all of a sudden, bam, it's as light as all get out. It's even lighter than the sun because we're talking about the glory of God. Not the sun and just its light, but the glory of God. And what it says is that they see this and they are terrified. But the angel says, look, hey, no need to be afraid. I'm here to give you some great news. This Messiah that you've been waiting for for a long time is now come and he's in Bethlehem. And you need to go find that baby wrapped in cloth lying in a manger. And then the tremendous choir of angels join in. They begin praising God. And you can imagine what it must have sounded like with all those voices singing praises to God. It must have been a sight to see. And I bet you probably think the same thing. But no sooner the cantata started, it was over. And the shepherds had this great news now. A Savior had been born. And look at Luke 2, 15. When the angels had left him and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened that the Lord told us about. So they leave their flocks, they go in the town, and they find Joseph and Mary, and they were amazed at what they, told, at what they had been told was true. And when they found the Savior, just like the angels said they would, on their way back, they don't go first to check on the sheep. They tell everybody about what this took place, Luke 2, 17. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. Now here is what's amazing, brothers and sisters. Out of all the people in the world, of all the people in Israel, even at that time that the Lord would have appeared to and told them, he chose to go to shepherds in the middle of a field. He didn't choose one of the great Pharisees. He didn't choose one of the great philosophers of the day. He didn't choose the king or any of the number of religious leaders that were out there. He didn't choose any of them. He didn't even go to people that were trained to do this. He goes to men that were untrained, and he tells them the Savior has been born. But here's what's amazing. Luke 2, 18. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. I want to make sure that you heard that. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. The people were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And I guarantee that the shepherds were not eloquent speakers. I guarantee they had no teleprompters whatsoever. I guarantee they just simply said, 
what they heard and what they saw, and they said it the best way they could. And the people were amazed. Now, the Greek word used there is the word thomazo, and what that word means is in wonder and amazement to marvel at something. So it wasn't like, well, this is really kind of a neat idea. This was, they were completely in attention to what the shepherds were saying, and they were amazed by it. Now, there's a principle here that would be very simple for you and I just to overlook, but make no mistake, it would be a mistake for us to do that. Because the principle can dispel the feeling of inadequacy of you and I ever sharing our faith. And that is this. The people were amazed. Why were the people amazed? Because of the power of the message, not the messengers. That's why they were amazed. By the way, this wasn't the only time that people were amazed by men who were untrained saying something about God. After the death, burial, and the resurrection and the ascension, Peter and John spoke before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And this is what it reads. It says, And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. By the way, it's the same with you and I today. You and I have been entrusted with a tremendously powerful message of hope, a message of peace, a message of love, a message of forgiveness. Sadly, though, it's easy for you and I to lose sight of just how amazing God's plan truly is. Every time I have ever had the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with any person, I'm amazed oftentimes how many different reactions I often get. Sometimes there's laughter because people laugh at, why would God do that for me? Sometimes there's crying because people are so broken by how they failed God, they're amazed that God would even love them and sometimes they're speechless because they don't even know what to say about an omnipotent God that came and did all this for them even if it was just them, and even though the reaction is different, it shows just how amazing the truth of Jesus Christ is because it can impact every single soul differently because you see, the fact is, Jesus meets our need, and it depends on the deepest need where we are at the time we hear the gospel, and yes, the gospel really is that great. It really can meet every need where you are right at the time that you need it. See, the world, we all know, operates on a performance-based value system. So because of that, they never saw Jesus coming. No longer do we have to perform. No longer do we have to get even. No longer do we have to pay back something. No longer do we have to do sacrifices of animals and a silly attempt to cover up our sinfulness. No longer was the law system that which would judge us. See, it seems... Too good to be true when you think about the gospel, but it is true because God is that great and his love is that strong. He paid the price for our sinfulness. The innocent took the place of the guilty and all he asks in return is for you and I to give ourselves fully back to him and to turn away from self-worship and start savior worship in our life. And by the way, if we will just worship and follow Jesus, we will find that life in him can really be a never-ending sense of relief for the soul. And that's exactly what everybody needs. See, right now you may be thinking, well, Bob, I'll tell you what. The day that the angels of God appear in a field and tell me to go tell people some stuff, then I'll do exactly what these shepherds do and I'll go out and do that exact same thing. But the fact is, we all know that God doesn't work in such dramatic ways all the time. But just because God doesn't give you a shepherd's field experience does not make his power or his message any less real or any less effective. Just ask anybody who has dedicated themselves to service to Jesus Christ, ask him this question, how has God changed your life? And you'll be amazed at all the unique answers that you get. Every one of them just as true. Every one of them just as powerful. But how God impacts each and every single one of us can be different. See, some people are pulled out of depression in their life. Some people actually go from horrible addictions and they wind up being cured. Some people's lives change from complete and total despair and anxiety. Some people's lives go from being somebody that's angry all the time to somebody that now begins to understand how God works in them. Some move from bitterness and loneliness into a life of forgiveness and acceptance. 
And they begin to find that they've always had a family of brothers and sisters. They just didn't see them because they didn't choose to see them. And all you need in order to share that message is the willingness and a sincere heart. No special training, by the way. The message has the power to draw people to God, not to you. And not to what you're doing. The pressure's off of you. See, that's the beautiful thing. The pressure is not on you to save people. All we have to do is tell people what Jesus does. The pressure's on him. And he can handle it. I promise. So those who think that you know, or those people that you talk to that think they know everything about God, they're not going to accept what you have to say anyhow. But those who desire to hear the truth, who desire to hear about love, faith, forgiveness, and all those things, they're going to be completely empowered when they hear about you and what Jesus has done for you. Because you know why? You're a real person. And what he's done for you, I bet he can do for me. So I want you to think about that. You see, grace moves people towards God in ways that guilt, in ways that pressure, in ways that human effort never, ever could. But when we forget all that amazing stuff that I just spoke about, Some people begin to grow bored with scriptures. And then we mindlessly take communion. We no longer hear the good news. We just know that the preacher is talking. It's just words. When that begins to happen in our life, I want you to know that those are symptoms of a dying faith. I want you to know that those are symptoms that your relationship is not where it needs to be with Jesus Christ. See, the message of Jesus Christ is so much more than just being saved from hell and then going about your normal daily business. It's so much more than that. Salvation through Jesus restores you and I back to the original grace under which we were born and puts us where God intended for you and I to be all the time. You see, only in a true relationship with Jesus will you ever find joy, will you ever find peace, will you ever find healing, wholeness, or blessing. Why? Because Jesus gives us purpose. And see, his purpose does something different than what the world does or what anything else can do in your life. His purpose gives you meaning. So, if you aren't noticing and experiencing change, even subtle changes in your life or in your heart or in your walk, then maybe your faith is wilting. Maybe it's not where it needs to be. And maybe, or maybe, you're just not paying attention to what the words of God are actually saying to you. And you're doing your own thing and thinking your own stuff. See, sometimes we can be hesitant with our faith because we have very little to share. Which will take us this morning to our next point. Prepared, but not polished. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 reads these words. In your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. See, we all struggle with the same issues in life. They may come at different times, but we all struggle. People all around us have the same hopes and the same dreams. Most of us all have the same thing in common. And when we have the opportunity from time to time to share with someone what God has done in our lives, we need to do so. Listen to what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, quote, unquote, it usually takes more than three weeks to prepare a good impromptu speech. Think about that for a second. The fact is he's not, even though he's joking, the fact is it's the truth. It doesn't eliminate the fact that we need to be prepared to answer when people say, why are you a Christian? We need to be ready to give an answer and maybe... Maybe if you don't have an answer, it's because you don't think enough about your faith. I don't want you to get confused when I mean by, I'm not saying special training or seminary training. I'm not saying that at all. But maybe you're not thinking about your faith, and therefore when somebody asks you questions, you don't share the gospel because you're not prepared. You've not thought enough about why you are who you are. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, what what questions are you talking about? Well, let me give you five That would really be good for you to ponder and think about and get prepared to answer at some point in your life. One is, why am I a Christian? Why am I a Christian? Certainly somebody's going to ask you that at some point. Why did you become a Christian? Number two, how has my faith in Christ changed my life? Number three, where would I be right now if I had not met Jesus? Number four, where was I before I met Jesus? And then number five, what's the difference? See, the fact is, when you really have contemplated those questions and how you would answer them in your life, you then need to make a habit 
of sharing that information. Start off with people you know. Start off with people that you love. Share with them the answer to those questions and why you've got that answer. But then work your way outside of your own little world and begin reaching out to people that you know need to hear the gospel message. But what you need to keep in mind is this. Eloquence is not necessary with sharing your story. What is necessary is a genuine heart and a desire to share it. Now, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. Nobody can tell your story about what Jesus has done for you better than you. You don't have to get choked up in the fact of, what do I say now? Just tell your story and what Jesus has done. Maybe it's at lunchtime sometime. Maybe it's in a break room. Maybe it's at school. Maybe it's with a person at a sporting event that you often see. Your presence, your demeanor will determine the opportunity when you'll be able to share. But we need to keep something in mind. And that's very important. The hearts of people are extremely important to God and we need to handle them with care. We don't need to manipulate a person in order to share Jesus. We don't need to scare them or put pressure on them in order to share Jesus. See, people respect gentleness. They appreciate honesty. They appreciate sincerity. So if you care about the relationship that you have with them, then remember, you have the most powerful information in the world that can change and transform a life. Don't you want to share that with them? And why wouldn't you if you don't? So when God places the opportunity in front of you to share, and he will, the world that is hopeless wants to know is their hope. And you have a chance to share that. Because it really does come down to you and what Jesus has done. So what will you say when you're asked? Which will take us this morning to our last point. And that is this, reason for hope. There's a story about a young man who was born blind. Now the cause for his blindness is unclear. But from birth, he had no vision. But it never, ever stopped him from doing anything that he wanted to do, and it never, ever stopped him from his faith that he had in Jesus Christ. So his senior year in high school, he was voted most popular, most likely to succeed, because he was an inspiration to every single person who knew him. So when he spoke at his high school graduation, he caught everyone's attention when he made this statement. He said, My lack of seeing has made my vision clearer than I could have ever imagined. Jesus helps me love people not based on their looks or on their abilities, but on who they are. I am so blessed. One day I will be able to see, and the first thing these eyes will see when they open up is the face of Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? Everyone began to applaud at his ability and how he adjusted to live without vision. There wasn't a dry eye in the school, but then he added this. But after I see the face of Jesus, I hope I see your face. But that can't happen to you, friends, unless Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And I pray that you have him as that. But then he ended with this. But if you don't know Jesus, come and see me. I'll help you find him. God bless you all, and I hope to see you someday. Now, while the young man could hear the thunderous applause that was going on, He couldn't see the tears in the eyes of not only every classmate, but every administrator, as well as every parent, and the fact that in the auditorium, they were giving him a standing ovation. He couldn't see that. When the school superintendent was being interviewed by the newspaper after everything was over about what his opinion was about the speech, as well as the young man, the superintendent said these words, David is not ashamed of being blind or being a Christian, and we're not ashamed of David. David has everybody, David has always been very open about his faith and about what God has done for him. And I have seen that young man change the lives of many kids simply because he was not afraid to be their friend. He was friendly to every single person from athletes all the way to those who have handicaps in our school. It didn't matter to him who you were as long as you didn't care who he was. David, sir, is a Christian and he will be missed in this school in more than one way. I hope that we have more Davids in our future, to which the reporter interrupted him. You mean more Christians? To which the superintendent said this. Well, if that means they're going to live and act like David, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. See, relationships, that's where evangelism begins. That's where it starts. We need to live a life that is on purpose. We need the desire to grow in our walk with Jesus so that as we grow, others begin to see that and grow and want to grow as well because they want what you've got. They know that you have access to it. You see, you don't need to be more religious. You don't need to be less religious. Just be yourself, be respectful, be courteous, but do not be ashamed 
of the gospel message. Do not be ashamed of what it's done for you. You don't need to be a polished, well-trained speaker. You just need to be prepared to tell people for the hope that you have, and that is in Jesus Christ. We all need to be more like the shepherds who received the good news but then told everybody about the good news. Imagine for a moment what it would be like if millions of unpolished heroes every day would actually take the gospel message that they hear and share it with every single person they see like the shepherds did. Be gentle, be respectful, but be ready because I promise that God's going to give you an opportunity to share what Jesus Christ has done. And there are people in this world that are experiencing emotional pain right now. There are people that have doubt and fear and they have pressure and they have loneliness and they have the burden of their past that they just don't know what to do with. Others really are doing okay. At least they think they're doing okay. They have a nagging emptiness though, even though they're doing okay because it's all about them, and it's all about what they're getting in their life. You see, without God, hope is really a fleeting moment. It's all in what's happening now, not what's happening in the future. See, most people want hope. Most people want to believe. Most people want a relationship with God, but because they do not know him, they think that he is like everyone else, and if they, everyone else doesn't want to be with me and doesn't want to be around me, then certainly God doesn't. See, you and I can change that. We can give them a reason for real hope because the power is in the message and not the messenger. Friends, today, I invite you to accept the grace of God by faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary's cross and in Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a brand new person in Christ, ready to do what you're called to do, but ready to share the hope that you have. If someone were to approach you today, and say, why are you a Christian? What's your answer? Because if you don't have one, the first thought will be, if you don't know why you're a Christian, why are you telling me to be one? Friends, we have to be ready. But that starts with a sincere relationship with Jesus Christ. Where are you at today?